ladies, I am so excited to have a full group of women here to talk about retail. Um, what I would love to kind of do is set some context. And if we could get started and talk a little bit or give everybody a, a little snapshot of what role you play in thinking through inventory levels at cannabis retail stores across Canada. Maybe Jen, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, uh, I guess I'll introduce myself. I'm Jen Larry. I work with MTL Cannabis. Um, I hold the role of Chief Commercial Officer, and I guess every day I wake up and think about how to make sure we get the best of the street to the shelf and, and keep it there. So, you know, a lot of the things that we're thinking about on a daily is how to progress our industry and afford it an opportunity to operate as mature as some of the other sectors. And for us, that's about being consistent in our product and, of course, um, making sure that we're not out of stock. So I'd say that that's kind of the thing that keeps us going every single day to be the brand that can keep their promises, especially as the boards are becoming more sophisticated and the buyers are really looking for those SKUs that can not only stand on the shelves that exist today, but as we're seeing with Ontario and of course with Alberta, the ongoing development of the retail footprint it certainly is a, it's a huge challenge, one that we are welcome to undertake, but to, to, to have SKUs that can afford almost all stores to have um, potentially great traffic drivers and really quality product that they're excited to share with their consumers. Amy, what role do you play? You have a lot of moving parts at once, I guess. It's part of your business. Talk to us a bit more about that. Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't think I've been on here since find, uh, founding, finding other people's pot, uh, but we are a sales agency. And so, you know, we have, we definitely play a role just working directly with retailers, helping them out um, to figure out their assortment and then working with our clients to make sure that we can really maximize um, where we all fit in. And I think for us, we're really focused on making sure that um, everything represents kind of the future that we want to see in this industry as well. So when I'm helping somebody with their assortment or I'm looking at our portfolio, which we do hope one day could kind of fulfill like somebody's needs as an assortment, we really do want to make sure that it's um, everything Jen said. And then as well, which I know Jen believes too, just having that uh, really forward looking you know, future focused idea of what the industry should look like. That's what we're really trying to make sure that our products can fulfill those needs beyond, you know, THC and even terpenes. <laughs> yeah. I think like forward thinking often also from a retailer perspective relates directly to the data piece. Abby, we talked a little bit earlier about like what role headset plays, but when you think about your relationship kind of day-to-day -day with retailers and inventory, talk to me about what that looks like. Yeah, it's a, there's a huge spectrum. There's some people who just have loved the plant forever and ever. And when legalization happened, they saw this opportunity to jump in um, and didn't realize that cannabis retail is the beast that it is. Um, and I see on the other end of the spectrum, people really understanding that inventory is one of their largest costs, second to probably labor. Um, and understanding that, especially here in Ontario and some of the other provinces, a lot of the retailers are really competing with the same products. Um, so what they need to do in order to create a really good assortment according to what people are naturally purchasing in store. We spoke a little bit earlier about um, the internal biases that they have and, and what they think is gonna sell really well versus what actually does sell really well. Um, so I think the data aspect of it is very, very important to understand what is actually being demanded and really narrowing down your your assortment to not have too much and not have too little. That's something that we think about at Petrini Group every day, um, yeah. specifically with retailers, is like, how do we make sure product is in the right place at the right time in the customer journey, both from online as well as in-store? What do we need from an inventory level to be able to fulfill these experiences that customers are looking for? And also the really great products that we can surprise customers with um, because that is, I think, a really interesting opportunity as we start to build out the depth and availability of products. So on depth and availability of products, I mean, not only has Canada seen a huge increase in total store count really over the last uh, like eight months, um, but also that store count has been matched with the number of SKUs that are available. And I think that adds a lot of complexity to decision-making 
And so um, we've seen kind of the total number of SKUs be in one place and what their sell through was in another place. Um, and that held pretty true at the beginning when we first opened stores and we had a limited amount of inventory decisions to make. But this is getting much more complicated. The amount of flour that sells through at one store versus con concentrates versus beverages all might vary depending on the store. Um, so maybe I'm going to go the reverse this time and, and Abby start with you. But how do you think that the complexity of inventory decisions around SKU availability has impacted retailers on a day-to-day? -day? And what do you wish that um, retailers would do to action on that, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, there's so many, as exactly like what you said, the number of SKUs are growing with the number of stores that we have here in Canada. Um, and I think it's really important, and this actually comes at a perfect time at Headset. We just released our assortment optimization dashboard as part of our retail premium model. Um, and that's all around ABC XYZ analysis. So actually assigning grades to your products, the ABC portion of it, assigning a grade to the number of, or the percentage of revenue that they're contributing to, um, and the XYZ portion of it, according to the basket penetration or how often these products are showing up in a basket. Um, so really focusing on those products that are really driving your revenue um, and really having to look at the data for that, because as I mentioned before, there are some internal biases or um, just some, some SKUs or products that are coming up more in conversations than others. Um, may not necessarily correlate with how they're contributing to their, your revenue and your growth at your store. Um, so really having to dive into the data to, to understand what's working, what's not working, and how can we um, really maintain a lean inventory to focus on the stuff that is working for us. Um, and especially with some, some stores that have stores in Northern Ontario, Southern Ontario, out in BC, out in Alberta, um, seeing the difference between those and really catering to your area. I think like retailers are now faced to make a lot more decisions than they had been. And so Amy, those decisions come with like varying amounts of product and, and information about that product. Um, what would be helpful or what do you find as the most helpful when taking information to retailers around being able to concisely communicate about SKU availability? Yeah. I think definitely, um, you know, knowing what the retailer's needs are and being really understanding of each specific store. Like you said, some people move different products at different times. And um, it's really important to see where you're, you know, where what we're bringing to the table can fit in and know that before I get there so that, uh, and make sure my team does too, so that we're really bringing the right things to the table, looking at the data as well, understanding what truly is moving, bringing challenges with the product. So if we understand that there is, you know, an education challenge or like a piece that needs to be explained a bit further, because it is a new product, just coming to the table with all that information and transparency, honestly, I think is just everything in this industry. And so launching, I've launched multiple new formats, definitely into this industry. I think with 48 North and now, you know, even the Dynathrive 30 piece uh, CBD gummies that we have, it needs conversation. Like the reality is there are three simple points that you can say that should get it across, but there is like that need for a deeper education. And that's where, you know, we want to work with the retailers that can tell that story and the ones that really do have that same commitment to moving the industry kind of in the direction that really consumers want. So that's where I think it's important to know your audience and know your customer and just work really closely with the right people. The other thing I think is important to mention just in all of this is that not everything is going to be moving at a rapid rate. Not everything is like the most exciting drop. We all go to the store for a bag of chips. And then sometimes we go to the store for like an Advil. And somebody on my team was talking to me about this this morning. I thought it was a really great point that um, it's, it's very you need to have that Advil, you need to have that slower moving skew for the person that shows up when they need it. So finding that real balance and finding out how that can truly fit into the assortment in a meaningful way, looking at data and bringing that to the table when you come and speak to a retailer about why that product should be in their store um, is super important to me because I want to make sure that what I'm telling them is true and that they can follow through on it and that consumers can, you know, understand it and pick up on it and that it does move this whole thing forward at the end of the day, because that really is what I want, would like to do. Yeah. I think being able to like pick up on those cadence pieces, you're absolutely right. Like not all of your inventory is going to um, move at the same rate or velocity. 
as all individual products. Um, I mean, the OCS right now in Ontario does offer like a top performing SKU list. And we often see that list replicated, which for me is like, that only tells us a snapshot of what could have been or what was, but we don't know if in our individual environment with our customers and with our team, what is possible. And so there is a bit of an opportunity to look at like where those opportunities will show up. Um, and how we measure that cadence. And so Jen, coming from the other side of things, how does this information inform your own product depth and your own assortment when you're thinking about what products are, there are gaps on the market? Sure, um, well, I, I guess for those who know, uh, you know, MTL Cannabis, we've kind of built our brand and business off of one skill. So kind of a little differently than I think a lot of the other uh, companies where they are demonstrating right out of the gates their incredible ability, because I definitely want to highlight that I think it's an exciting time for the industry. I think that we're all in good company and we're starting to see the quality of product and, and the type of products, you know, really change. For us, it was more about really evaluating who we were and who we needed to be and have a value proposition that mattered. And, you know, our promise to the market is that we are a flower first company. So we spend a lot of time focusing on what that means and less about how many different cultivars we can put into the market in a quarter because we're here for the long game. And so I think, you know, to highlight a little bit what Amy was saying about where different stores will have, you know, different audience groups. And of course, that could create different types of, you know, strategies on, on how the stores will see sell through or whether or not your product will even be meaningful. For us, the gap in the industry is dried flour. As funny as that sounds, because even though in Canada, unfortunately, we throw away so much of it. I think we're all really excited when you look at the patterns that are happening, uh, particularly in Colorado, because of you know how they've really matured and leaned into what flower means. We're really, really pumped, you know, to be a privately owned small company with one SKU that has been blessed to sit in those top fives. Um, and I think that's because we're working very hard to stay really committed to the craft of growing the flower that the consumer who wants to smoke their weed wants to see. And so that's, I think, our different approach. You know, we're not trying to be everything to everyone out of the gates. We know there's a ready to grind and a ready to roll and a ready to smoke. We talk all the time about consumer occasions and, you know, satisfying moments. Um, and, you know, at the end of it, we try to keep it pretty simple. Let's just put out one product that hopefully speaks for itself and that we could get a lot of feedback from the, you know, the people who are on the front lines and those are the bud tenders. We try to really stay in the shadows and not be the brand that comes out with an aggressive approach of why they need us because I think we've accepted that this relationship is a very mutual exchange. Um, so, you know, that's what we're looking at. We're looking to fill the gap or more importantly, create the, the you know, the, the space where brands that have real brand ability, brands that you know are meaningful and matter to the consumer, can can find their place. And you know, so far, while we're only eight nine months on the market, it, it you know brings us great joy on a daily that MTL Cannabis has managed to go coast to coast. But I'd say that's something that you know is is critical to no matter what category you're in. The other part, just to add to it, that I think was really important for us was to not only know who we are, but understand who the consumer was and how much disposable income they have. And when you have an early onset of an industry, we could, you know, compartmentalize craft and premium and, you know, budget and BFM all we want, but there's affordable cannabis that will always matter. And categorically in any sector, when you live in BFM and you crush it because your product seems to have more value than your price, you will find yourself sustaining. And so kind of those are some of the things that we're using when we're thinking about how to not have to build a business that has more loss leaders than we need and not have to have a business that requires product A to compensate for product B. It's easier said than done when you only have one SKU. But I think, you know, we're trying to kind of really map a course that can, can help a privately owned business really, you know, get its legs and then bring our, our, our subsequent offers to the market. I think you bring up a number of really important points and, and uh, maybe all of them, I would highlight that there is power in restraint. 
And there is power and restraint both from the buy-in to be able to see products perform from a retail store level, um, but also in the power that that enables the team to know the products that you carry. And so um, when we were earlier talking about 270 SKUs in your total on-hand inventory level, it can roll out of control really easily um, because we reinvest in products to try and get them to move. Um, and we haven't segmented in on a particular customer or customer behavior. And so I think personally, um, and Petrina Group would uh, all stand behind this, is that um, there is going to be power in being able to connect specifically with a customer group and what inventory you need to be able to support that group. And it isn't everything for everybody. So that being said, I think if there was one purchasing decision that you could give to retailers moving forwards around their inventory, what piece of advice would you share with them? Because I think you all come from a very different perspective um, of what would be important to you and a different way of looking at their total on-hand inventory level. Maybe Amy, can we start with you? Sure. I have so many. I'm trying to decide what I want to <laughs> impart. Um, a few really quick ones would be definitely listen to your bud tenders. I love what Jen is saying. Um, it is a totally mutual relationship. And if there's respect there, then that will lead to uh, success. And I think that works at the retail level as well. Listen to the the what your bud tenders are looking for. Do it with, you know, a sense of understanding of the general market, of course. And uh, but yeah, that would be an important one. Um, another one for us, you know, we say good weed is good business, as I said, and I think that that really does mean stocking products that will help build the industry you want to see tomorrow. And so that goes beyond um, the actual quality of what's in the bag to sustainable companies that truly do uh, put, you know, the future of the industry first. And I think that is another really important piece where we can all decide what we want to do. So I would say like help, you know, build that industry forward of what you're looking for. Um, and yeah, I'd say also, you know, look at data and look at all of that, but also um, look towards the future and try to understand that people that buy cannabis today are not necessarily going to be the people that buy it tomorrow. So I always try to tell people that, you know, you want to build the future and you want to satisfy right now so that you can be there <laughs> when the future really does arrive. And so while we're helping the soccer mom figure out that cannabis is a better option than wine, make sure that you have the right selection to bring in and help us, you know, bring in the legacy market, help people understand why shopping here is great, why they might want to actually bring their business into this industry and create products underneath the health candidate umbrella that we all love to hate to love. And we're all very, very lucky to be doing it uh, at this level and in this industry right now and on the legal side. So I'd love to see that gap close between those pieces. And I think these are the ways that we can do that. Retail is one other thing I'll add and Jay, you can <laughs> do what you'd like with this piece. But I do think that retailers have the ability to really define um, what great quality weed means in this industry. When you have lists and lists of 20 plus percent, this is what's 20 plus and people are just going right there. I think it does kind of uh, take away from the ability for the consumer to kind of make up their mind. Nobody's looking at wines that are only over 15%. Nobody's looking at, they're looking at regions, they're looking at flavors, they're looking at so many things. So I think it is up to the retailer as well to pick products and put it out there to their consumers in a way that kind of challenges some of the, you know, things that have emerged from uh, the stigma really and all these other things that um, don't really serve the consumer today. So, and do it in a digestible way, right? Like yes. both digestible from your team perspective, but also for your customer. Like, how are we enabling our customer to explore these other options? How are they presented um, in a way that allows for simple decision making? And you're absolutely right. Like, we need to look at what happened and acknowledge the past. So, this is true for like, our, our sales in the store level, but then identify, okay, where are there going to be the gaps and the opportunities for us as our customer evolves and as we enter and have new customers. So Abby, I'm going to throw it back at you now because you're the data yeah. piece of this. Um, what would be one piece of advice that you wish retailers would think about when thinking about their inventory? Like exactly what it what you said. I'm coming from the data perspective. So I would really suggest that retailers figure out what they need to get off of their shelves 
before they reinvest in something, a new product that may end up being a top seller at your store, right? Krista, you touched on this earlier. There's top 10 selling SKUs lists that come out all the time, um, but it may you may end up investing in a product that performs really, really well at your individual store. Um, and that's something that you can compete on. So keep it short and simple, figure out what you need to get rid of first before reinvesting in a new product. And Jen, I mean, the example of keeping it tight. Um, what is that? What piece of advice? I think you're thinking a lot about data and analytics that feeds into why that skews the way that it is and how that information gets communicated. What piece of advice would you give retailers about their inventory? Sure. I mean, you know, I'm kind of going to pull it from my music business years. It's like a playbook. You have to have a record store that has more inventory that you would like, and you need to understand that your audience is genre based and there's a lot of crossover. And I think even to Amy's point, when she was talking about, you know, some of the CBD gummies, there isn't one fit for all. So your consumer today can become your consumer tomorrow. So I think even to Abby's earlier points about the baskets, understanding the baskets, understanding the consumer moments, understanding how you want to help curate those sessions for your consumers based on where they live and how they interact with you. Um, to me, that that's what makes a great buyer. Um, I think what's important to highlight though is one of the things we're really realizing is because of the way the provinces work and the buyers, you know, they have to put their money out first and then they're waiting. It certainly would never be for a brand that's blessed to be on their shelves to ever tell them how to manage their inventory. But I would say that, you know, being bullied into inventory is never a sign of how to successfully sell through in your store. I think you have to be brave and set trends and feel confident that you guys are helping create leaders in the market. It's okay to love something and, 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 and to lean in on it. Um, but you know, buying your inventory is knowing your inventory. It's no different than working at a restaurant. If you don't know what's on your menu and what ingredients will be out, you know, allergens and which ingredients will delight somebody, your inventory choices always live at a high risk. So I'd say, you know, just being really cognizant of why that inventory matters, how you want to split up your store and to, you know, to, to be aware of the trends, but not to assume that you need to overly stock on a format that today doesn't have the best interest of your bottom line at heart. So I think growing and knowing and, you know, listening to groups like other people's pod and, you know, all the groups that are going across the country, being educated, um, but being smart about your dollars. You know, dollars out has to return threefold, if not fourfold on the margins on dollars in. So I think for me, if I could just add that in, it goes back to seeing the brands that allow for that kind of, you know, kind of almost upstream of pricing to happen. You cannot buy from a main board at such a high price and think you're going to put it on your shelf at such a high price and assume that's going to be a fast mover for you. So, you know, it's not really advice. It's just like collaboration as peers that when we're making smart choices on where to put our dollars and how to have some liquid so that we could stay agile, um, take risks. And, and I think, you know, be smart and, and push back on some of the uh, licensed producers that maybe are producing cases that are too large in their format. You know, we've been very blessed. We put out a 12 pack and we did that because we want these stores to be able to afford to carry our products. So I'd say, you know, that's the biggest thing. Look for companies that are not only willing to work with the boards, but are looking to work with the independent stores who understand not just shelf space in the front, but inventory levels and how to manage that. And, you know, don't be afraid to reach right for the top and, and tell the LPs what you want, because I could say, at least from my seat, we're listening and we're building the future because we want to be like, you know, the chocolate bars and the Q-tips and, and the paper towels. We want our buyers to know that, that we get them. And again, going back to inventory is, is part of what the business is, but clearing that inventory without having to move into clearance is really what will be successful for companies at the end of the day. You're totally right. Inventory is a art and a science. And so being able to supply the information and the data that can help guide decisions and the cadence to which those decisions need to be made. But a lot of the um, bold action that you're talking about is the art. It's like getting to know and who your customer is and who your team is and how they can interact with the product. 
And so being able to connect those products together from an experience perspective for your customer, whether that be the way that it is displayed in store, how it shows up on your website, how bud tenders prompt it, what role the product plays in terms of the journey through the store all is really important. And so ladies, I want to thank you so much. This has been great. I think um, after this, everybody will be in a breakout room. So if you have more specific questions for Jen, Amy, or Abby, hop in there and I will be hopping around too to answer your questions. Thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you.